Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I know you can't see me. My name is uh, Dr. Josh Dubro, uh, professor of political science, uh, professor of sociology here at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences, and uh, the Graduate School for Social Research and EPSPAN to organize uh, this lecture by Fulbright Global Scholar, Professor Farida Jalalzai, and her, she is a professor of political science at Virginia Tech University. And uh, her presentation today, which will be hybrid, uh, so she will be online, and there's an audience here uh, in the conference room. And uh, the presentation will be on women presidents and prime ministers, pathways, powers, and impact. Hey, thank you so much, Josh, for the introduction. Okay, so thank you so much for having me here. It's an absolute pleasure to be presenting today. Um, what I aim to do is kind of walk us through some of the, the trends, I guess, regarding women's rise to presidencies and prime ministerships across the globe. Um, and in doing that, I'll talk a little bit about some of the explanations for why it is some countries have had women in power and why other countries haven't, um, and also things that would maybe we are able to unpack in terms of pathways to power. But I'd like to move more in the discussion to discussing um, why it matters to have women at the helm. Um, it's one thing to be able to say you have had a woman crack the glass ceiling, but does it really actually make a difference when we're thinking about policies, when it, we're thinking about women's presence in other, in other positions. And also critically, um, what I'm trying to learn more about and contribute to is more of the literature that unpacks women's symbolic empowerment and whether and how as visible political symbols, women presidents and prime ministers create opportunities for future women leaders. Um, and, and generally speaking, why women's presence matters for democracy. Um, so I'd also like to discuss why I'm in Poland, what it is that I'm doing for the Global Fulbright. So I hope to be able to cover all of this ground in, in the next several minutes um, and leave enough time for discussion, questions, comments, advice. Um, so if we're looking at the trends um, related to women's rise in executive posts, there's no, there's no way I can, you know, not admit that women have gained ground. So I started this research agenda years and years ago. And so I remember the first article I think I ever published um, back in 2004, tracked women presidents and prime ministers. And at that time, only 44 women had, had been in any of these positions. Um, if you fast forward in time, um, that has changed substantially. So women's presence has more than tripled in heads of state, heads of government positions. And we knew this from the beginning, but they, they do come into positions across the globe in a variety of settings, some expected, some less than expected. Um, and what my research tried to do from, from there on out, so my first book, really try to um, statistically explain <laughs> what it is that's happening. Why is it that some glass ceilings are durable and, and why is it women are able to get in and other systems, but also what are the pathways? What are the, the different um, trajectories that women take to positions of power? Um, and I think we can still say that there are a lot of limitations that women face when we are trying to account for how they get into power, into their positions and also the powers that they are able to use when they are in office. So I'd say progress, but progress is limited. So the geographical breakdown um, is as such. So I'll say a few things about some of the regions. So where I'm actually really, I was originally drawn to was, was Asia um, because we've had the first female head of government in the world in Sri Lanka, that was in 1960. And then based on my own family story, um, you know, we had in Pakistan, a female prime minister 
Whereas I grew up in the United States and I never thought this question would even be relevant in 2022, but we had not had a woman president yet. And so we can, we can say, you know, some of the things that we, in, we would intuit that, oh, it's where there's more progress, where there's more gender equality, that's where you're going to see women at the helm. And, you know, the story is a lot more complicated than that. Asia has had quite a few women in power. They've somewhat stalled. And there's definitely a connection we can make between women typically holding weak positions there or being parts of family dynasties, which can explain some of the, some of the cases that seemingly were puzzling at the, at the start of this research. Um, and then my second book covered Latin America, um, where you had quite a few women in the beginning who were the wives of former leaders, uh, first ladies, who were able to leverage that to take over um, as presidents. Um, but that pattern shifted quite a bit for a period of time when we had four women who were leading their countries as presidents and they no longer necessarily had to have a, a kinship tie. So of course we had Michelle Bachelet in Chile, um, Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, um, Laura Chinchilla in Costa Rica, and then more of that traditional model, um, Fernandez de Kirchner in Argentina. Um, and we've had other areas in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where you'll see quite a few women who are, who are in power in today as well, but have typically been relegated to much weaker positions of prime ministerships versus presidencies. So Ellen Johnson Sirleaf is somewhat of an outlier when we're talking about a woman who held power that was dominant power in their system. And then in Europe, to no surprise, the most women cases here, and half of the women cases in Europe are from Central and Eastern Europe. And I'll talk a little bit more about the geographical aspects throughout the discussion. So where do women lead now? Um, well, let's get to that in a second. This slide is, so what I did yesterday was I tried to provide updated numbers um, to um, show some of the most recent information. Um, and there are things that I can, I can weave in in, in in so far as some of the factors that typically we can identify with women coming to power. Um, so what we have in terms of, of the cases, 147, I don't study non-autonomous countries. So that's why I don't reference Taiwan. Um, I also try to only look at positions that are pretty, pretty much like a traditional prime ministership or traditional presidency or equivalents like chancellors, meaning I don't study captain regents. I don't um, also focus on, on um, collective, their collective presidencies. So um, th this, these are the cases that I select. And right now we have almost 150 in, in the history of, of the world. Um, and then prime ministerships versus presidencies. Women are typically more prone to hold prime ministerships versus presidencies. But at the same time, women have gained ground when we're looking at their ability to gain presidential positions. Um, we also know that quite a few of the early cases, especially, were women who came in on a temporary basis. So women who were entrusted um, to maybe lead a transition, for example. Um, but you know, we have some examples where you know they were only in power for like a few days or a few months. And I think you could make the argument that we have to be a little bit careful of treating them, treating them the same as others that are there on a more permanent basis. So the prime ministership presidency um, aspect, um, when we look at some of the factors that you know, we have to account for, the, the things that I expanded on in my first book really were that these are not at all necessarily equivalent positions. Just because we have a president of Ireland doesn't mean that it entrusts that president with the same powers as a US president, for example. Um, and I don't, that's not revolutionary that we know that there's a lot of differences um, between systems and positions, but there weren't a whole lot of, of works that were really dedicated to focusing on 
women's ability to navigate these positions and how gendered ideologies may have impacted where it is that women were placed. Um, and then also with the prime ministerships, yes, as I noted in Africa, they're not equivalent roles as a prime minister of, of Poland, for example. So we'll talk about that more um, in, a, in a moment, but let's look at people who are in power right now briefly. Um, and so what this is, is a slide on women presidents and you'll see there's a lot of diversity as has been the case over time that women have led in many different regions. Um, and what I try to do in my work um, to convey to you here is, are they weaker positions? Are they more powerful positions? Are they dominant positions? And so the theories that I've tried to develop were that women are going to struggle um, more to acquire dominant positions. Um, and, and that has very much to do, I think, with ideas regarding women's proper place. Um, the, the types of stereotypes that we have of men and women. Um, it wasn't so much of a surprise to see women as ceremonial leaders because the number one, they don't usually have to navigate a popular election. It's an indirect election. Um, number two, they're there to really be more of the public symbol, um, but aren't really in, entrusted with substantive power. That's not very threatening when we think about it from a gender perspective. On top of that, or maybe related to that, quite a few of these cases don't have parties that, are, that, that they're a part of, or they've had to resign their party affiliation. Um, and, and so where you have women, so for example, Africa, the region has the tendency to have very dominant presidencies. We see in Tanzania, a woman who's holding a dominant post, but like many women who've held dominant presidencies, um, they've actually been able to succeed to the presidency when they were positioned as vice president, when there was an opening, in this case, the death of the president. Um, so that's that's a trajectory that we see tying a lot of the cases together. Um, then, but at the same time, you have a few examples of, of women who are dominant. Latin America stalled completely when it came to being first for a little while, it was this women presidents of Latin America are making their mark. And this is a great example of a region where they're past the family dimension and they're it no longer are women relegated to the sidelines except that Shimora Castro in Honduras, I'm not saying she doesn't have political qualifications or political experience, but she's the former first lady. Um, so we'll unpack all of that and, and move forward. The prime ministers are more typically dominant. Um, so the stereotypes that we've had typically of a prime minister tend to go along with feminine, feminine, feminine stereotypes or at least don't rule women out. So what do I mean by that? Um, I, hard, I almost never say women are really advantaged. I say women are not necessarily as <laughs> disadvantaged or disadvantaged to an extent that, you know, would relegate them to inferior positions. So when we're looking at the prime ministership, um, we know that, for example, some of the stereotypes that we have of women is, you know, a compromiser. Is that something we've heard before? Um, someone who can bring different groups of people together for consensus building. The paths are different for prime ministers through appointment um, versus a popular election with a dominant president. Tenures are more um, tenuous, right? I mean, you may be um, cast out in a moment's notice, um, depending on the system um, and the rules of the game. Whereas if I'm from the United States, whereas um, you can pretty much be assured you'll be able to fulfill your term. Although we have to also acknowledge the impeachments of women leaders recently too. So let's talk about that as well later. But you have, you have this um, array of women in power as prime ministers. Uh, France just had, had their second female prime minister take power the other day, I put a question mark 
because I'm just not sure at this point. We know that because she's from the same party as the president, she's going to not have as much autonomy. Um, but I'm just going to put it out there in the universe that we'll see. Um, but I'm not going to immediately relegate her as weak. Um, so, so the dominant versus weak versus powerful. Also, I'm not saying it's a perfect system. And I do think it's extremely difficult to know what happens in reality in every single one of these systems. So when I came to Poland, it was quickly, I was quickly informed, um, well, the prime minister isn't necessarily the strongest person in this system right now. So cases for trying to get to the countries and dig deep. Um, before I get to the why it matters to have women at the helm, I wanted to just briefly mention a few other factors. So Josh, the trends, <clears throat> the trend slide. Um, in addition, so we have to really look at a lot of the institutional dimensions that I've highlighted. Um, a lot of where women are able to come into power, they are structures that have dual executives. So there's a presidency and a prime ministership. It's not just a presidency like we have in the United States, or there's some systems that are purely parliamentary systems, um, like New Zealand, for example. Um, so that matters statistically. That's a it's an explanation of where it is that women have have governed. Um, there's also a relationship between transition. <laughs> this is more obvious and quality. Honestly, it's more obvious when you do the qualitative research. Um, but there, there are lots of cases that we can point to where there are these <laughs> openings, there's these political vacuums, transitions um, after maybe the opening up of systems, democratization, independence from colonial authorities, or even in more stable systems, long, long lasting democracies, what people will often, you know, say are like just these, these moments where there weren't men who were either able or up to leading because of crisis moments. So there is a lot in the, in a lot of the gender research, some of these indications that, you know, openings, unstable situations, political vacuums can sometimes work to work to have I mean, at least a greater openness to women in positions, whether or not they're able to leverage that to more permanent, um, permanent tenures is, is a big question. Um, and I think, you know, other than that, any, and I think I mentioned the familial ties that was strong in many of these regions and is statistically strong. So other, other things that I'll talk about will come up, I think, organically, but I didn't, I didn't want to ignore that um, as we discuss this more. So why does it matter? Why do we care? Um, okay, because it's possible that women who are in these positions can help enhance democracy. So when we look at the so what question, you know, we're thinking about different literatures. So it's no secret as a gender scholar, most people focus on women in the legislature. And I was for a long time, I think someone who was just interested in other positions of power. And I was really interested in presidencies and prime ministerships because I thought, well, yeah, I mean, I don't even necessarily know if people are aware of the percentage of women in parliament. I don't know. You know, I don't know to the extent to which if you ask an average American, they know the percentage of women in the Senate or if they know the percentage of women in the House. I suspect it works similarly in Poland. Um, but I would know if there is a female president. I would even know, I think, if, you know, we had a weak president and I think I would still be able to know the person's name. I'd be able to see a high profile person. Even if on paper, the substance wasn't as big, I could see them performing, even performing ceremonial duties. It's a visible, it's a visible performance of women's leadership. So understandably, a lot of what, what the women in executive scholars started to do to try to get to the 
Okay, so now we kind of know why they're they are where they are and why they're not where we think they should be. We didn't really assess why does it matter? So we used a lot of the work of, of Hannah Pitkin, understandably, um, and, and thinking about the concepts of, you know, descriptive representation and substantive representation and symbolic representation. So there was a, um, an edited collection that I think this is where I debuted the, the women in executive empowerment model. Um, but it was really supposed to more tailor the impacts to someone who would hold a presidency or a prime ministership versus what a lot of Pitkin's applications were, were to legislators. Um, so to move it back. So why do we care? Well, first of all, I think presidents and prime ministers are highly visible, as I said. Also, depending on the position, if you have appointment powers, you could appoint more diverse cabinets, for example. And I'm not, and I'm not at all pretending that it's not without its complications. The last book I wrote was about Brazil and Dilma Rousseff. So I am very aware of the, the vulnerabilities that coalition government presents. So it's not as though you have complete power over it is who it is that you want to be part of your government, that you'll get them appointed. No, it's so much more complicated than that. But um, you can make the argument that women may be more likely to appoint diverse cabinets. And part of that is about the social networks that they are a part of, that they may be more likely to, to know women in networks versus the typical explanation for not having women in cabinets is, oh, there are no qualified women. Maybe it's that your circle is too small. But I've also heard women presidents make that same claim. So it's not this perfect relationship where you have a woman president who's empowered to appoint their cabinets and that they automatically you know, appoint a diverse array of, of actors. But the appointment and then the policy making, um, a lot of the gender and scholarship literature more broadly does indicate on balance that women leaders do tend to advocate for policies that um, are more empowering to women, including things like um, daycare, more generous social policies, daycare policies, um, and um, in general, healthcare policies that we stereotypically associate with, with a feminine area. And, and at the same time, we recognize the complexity of that. If somebody doesn't have, a, if somebody doesn't have, um, you know, a legislative majority, that's going to be really difficult. If this is even something that you intend on doing, the realities on the ground may be different, but policy making as we can, as we can see from some of the, the women in executive literature does indicate on balance that this may be something that women are able to, to do for, for women and why it matters. The reason why I was also drawn to Latin America was that it presented a great opportunity to compare women who came in, who succeeded men from their same party, in many cases were, you know, really supported by these men figures to see if they did, if they did things differently. And the, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, unpack that with you later. And probably to no surprise, it goes a little bit of something like, well, it sort of depends. <laughs> depends on the leaders. Um, but but on balance, women were more inclined to support policy making that was more empowering towards women and marginalized groups in general. I'm interested in symbolizing. Um, so the extent to which women can, can by, by the fact that they're visible women, symbolize um, what it's, what a woman in power is like and how that will maybe affect people's perceptions of women's suitability for office or maybe have people be inspired to be a politician themselves or more broadly participate in politics. Maybe they think that actually the system is fair when we see people like us at the helm. 
This slide, um, it captures the appointment process. So this is a slide of Dilma Rousseff, who was president of Brazil. Um, and the more recent picture is Bolsonaro, who's president of Brazil. Um, and in between, right after um, Rousseff's impeachment, um, we had her succeeded by her vice president, Michelle Temer, who actually, that would have been a better slide, a better picture to include. I don't think that they, they had a real picture though um, that was easily accessible, but Temer appointed no women, all right? Dilma um, appointed many more women than her successors, including Lula, combined. She wavered, I think, in the second term because of coalition dynamics and all of the, the economic and the political crises that she was facing. Um, and then Temer decided he'd appoint no women. And then Bolsonaro begrudgingly appointed two women who ha he has attacked verbally multiple times. Um, and, and so we thought that my co-author and I, Pedro Dos Santos, um, unpack not just the appointment dimensions, but also the, the, the gains and the losses, the gains and the losses for women in Brazil. And then, so here is a picture that I found. One of the, one of the things, of course, when we're thinking about the visibility of women is, are they visible on an international stage? There's no question Angela Merkel was visible on the international stage, right? There was no question. Um, this is from 2019, the G20 Osaka summit. Really only two of those women there, there's three women pictured, only two of them are women heads of, of, of government. Um, and so that sends us, and that's, you know, that sends a signal, I think, of where women, where women are placed and sends a message about maybe women's progress or lack of progress or just women's inclusion. Um, there was another picture from that year I couldn't get a photo of because of copyright problems. And it was a, a much more interesting picture in a way that it pictured all of the spouses of these leaders. And there was one, it was Theresa May's spouse that was, was a man. So in the United States, um, uh, as we know, in 2008, Hillary Clinton you know, came close to the nomination and Obama ultimately won the Democratic nomination and ultimately won the presidency. And um, by 2016, when Obama was done with his two terms, it wasn't a really open contest. I mean, it was, it was a contest such that the Democrats were kind of united more or less to give Hillary Clinton the nomination. Obviously we have these processes that we engage in the United States with different primaries and caucuses. Um, but really the only major challenger that Hillary Clinton had for the nomination was Bernie Sanders. By 2020, and so we all know how the Hillary Clinton Trump election turned out and I'm happy to discuss that more um, in the, in the Q&A. Um, so did that, how did that maybe potentially affect women's willingness or interest in, in running for the, for the primary in 2020? Well, we had record setting numbers of, of women. So six in 2020, um, and I don't remember how many men were also running, um, but the contest was huge, but it was diverse. Um, it was diverse in terms of gender. It was in, it was diverse in terms of race. Um, ultimately, we selected an unsurprising candidate, um, and we can talk about that more in a moment. But the whole idea of symbolic empowerment is, you know, with the visible symbols, you know, you can actually, part of it is you can actually aspire to this. Um, that it's something that's not, that you're not ruled out for because you see people like you being represented in, in positions or in high profile candidacies. Um, and also it's not, it's also not, I mean, a lot of the resistance I think that people have to this idea of empowerment is this idea that, um, well, that means that men are going to lose, right? 
And what we actually know is that there are, there are symbolic benefits that men are afforded to when they have more diverse representation. And so this is a headline from when we were about to have Kamala Harris, who was obviously vying for the Democratic nomination, ultimately became um, vice president, the first female vice president and female um, person of color vice president. We should also add that she she represents Black communities in theory and South, South Asian communities in theory. Um, and this headline from NBC News says that on inauguration day, she gives America's boys and girls more of an afterthought, you know, a new role model. And so what a lot of the literature on symbolic representation and, and symbolic um, empowerment actually shows is that there are lots of benefits for men as well, whether it's uh, maybe being more efficacious, um, feeling like the system is more fair, um, so it's not a zero sum game, not that I ever thought empowering women was. Um, and so this was a highlight of the last two years um, was all of a sudden the world started to pay attention to that, the fact that there were women leaders. <laughs> and a typical headline from, from the pandemic was this, ex this idea that women leaders were better at handling the, the pandemic or the, the, yeah, the pandemic, and what do they have in common? Um, so they would ha have the headlines would be, you know, high profile women like Ardern or Cy um, or Angela Merkel, um, Jacob's daughter in Iceland and, and the like um, would be applauded for the way that they handled the pandemic. And then at the same time, there were some articles that came out um, that that showcased the the not so great performances of Donald Trump or Bolsonaro, for example, um, and and trying to link some of the the response approaches to gender. And so, what I think that you know I'd like to you know work our way to discussing is you know not only of course are there some prevailing factors that have to be acknowledged. So these are typically, not always, but typically women who are in these positions of power leading states that are, are you know, better equipped <laughs> to respond to a pandemic. But it doesn't, it doesn't tell the whole story either. That's like, I, I understand state capacity matters, but actually there's a lot of mixed results when we look at the variables um, and a lot more to some of the, the different types of leadership traits that were invoked about listening to scientists and being humble enough to change your trajectory when it seemed like everything you're doing was not the right thing. Um, and, and putting people first, putting um, the health of people first above <laughs> even things like the economy. Um, and so one of the women that's not pictured on the slide is the president of Tanzania President Hassan that I mentioned had come in as a successor to an anti, well, he was a COVID denying president who ultimately died um, and completely changed the response trajectory. So, um, so, the, so that's a lot of stuff I've said, <laughs> but to bring it back to the Global Fulbright research, um, the Global Fulbright um, is an opportunity for scholars that really try to study some of these larger phenomena like women's, in my case, women's empowerment through the executive to be, be able to do a little bit more digging across regions. Um, and, and so my question for this project was about the political symbol. Um, so the political symbol effect. And so I was interested in places where there are several different examples of women presidents or prime ministers or both. And one thing I didn't mention was that rather than, so that number has grown a lot, the number of women. Um, and at the same time, most of the time when I update my numbers, I don't have to add a new country. <laughs> so, so yes, yesterday I added Hungary, weak woman president. Um, 
but I didn't have to add France. And so one of the biggest um, things that I think we know so far and statistically is that there is a relationship between where women have come to power in the past and where they're coming in future times. So second, third, fourth time. Um, and, and it's not just that these are, these are places that in all of these other ways would be more open to women because the story is way more complicated than that. Um, but I'm interested in knowing as political symbols, do they, do they challenge people's perceptions of what executive office means? Do they in any way improve people's percep perceptions of women in power? And do they enhance political engagement um, among the public? And so one of the, the things that I'm arguing is that, yes, there's some confirmation that women are appointing more women and implementing policies that are more empowering towards women. Um, but we have had a hard time, I think, really studying the symbolic empowerment effects. And so this is my attempt to add to that conversation and build our knowledge uh, about that. So um, as I said before, women executive research is growing. It's actually still not that much of a focus compared to women in parliament. Um, to my knowledge, there really isn't research that digs deeply into this question of what glass ceilings that are seemingly shattered, what, they, what the story is about that, and how, if and how, past cases prompt women's future successes. Um, and, and so does, is there really a virtuous symbol um, effect? Does it depend on the system or even in the places where, you know, what Finland, I think has had four women leaders um, there, or is it more complicated? And also, you know, does that, does that mean that gender places no more obstacles uh, on women's political, political um, presence? Um, so, as I said, the countries with multiple instances of women leaders um, seemingly suggest that gender doesn't curtail somebody's political pursuits. Um, seemingly wouldn't impact their governance in office, but I don't, I mean, from the very beginning, that's, a, I think, a, a not very, um, I don't know, I don't think that we can, we can at all assume that. So trying to really get a sense of how previous cases affect future cases. So last summer I did um, field work in Iceland. Iceland has had three women in power. The first was a female president who was the first woman who was actually elected president around the world. Um, and then they went on to have two female prime ministers. And the current, the current prime minister of Iceland is female, Katrin Jacob's daughter. And so I'm in Poland now, and next summer I should be in New Zealand. Um, so, the, so the method is trying to gain more of an understanding of these phenomena from in-person interviews, and so I try to interview political insiders. Those include academics, journalists, um, representatives from relevant organizations, current and former parliamentarians and cabinet ministers from different parties, and possibly women who have served as prime ministers and presidents. Um, and, and I say that because it's really interesting to hear their perspective of what it meant or what it means <laughs> And it, it's interesting to hear a woman who's held power explain where women are placed or not placed. You know, it's just, it's really interesting. And I'm not pretending that there's always agreement, there usually isn't, but I'm also interested in knowing where there's disagreement and where there's some, there are occasionally things that everybody agrees on. Um, and, and, and I also try to the best of my ability to consult representative surveys and you know, an array of different types of prompts that assess women's engagement and um, participation and, and the like. And of course I track cabinet, um, cabinet appointments and I try to consult things like budget data re relevant to ministries 
Um, so those are, it's not just interviews, qualitative interviews, but that, that plays, I think, a major role. And then I chose Poland because Poland has had three female prime ministers. And so Hannah Suchowska, who was prime minister 1992 to 1993, and then Ewa Kopacz, who was prime minister from 2014 to 2015, and then Beata Szydło, prime minister from 2015 to 2017. Um, and, and so what, what I'm trying to do right now is the elite interview part, the expert interview part. And, and after field work, I will assess the preliminary findings. What I would really then try to do is gain more information from representative studies. And I also, so in some of these conversations have learned about new surveys that are in the works. Um, for example, the European Survey Project, that will have a lot more information when it comes to gender. Um, and I look at this as an opportunity to assess existing work, but also design future scientific studies, maybe experimental research that more fully engages stereotypes related to executive power. Um, Poland is actually being used for two book projects. So, the one that I'm here for related to Poland, a virtuous circle of women's leadership is more global, um, New Zealand, Iceland, Poland, and in other cases to be determined. Um, and then in fact, before the pandemic, I had started another book project um, about women presidents and prime ministers in Central and Eastern Europe and had done field work in Croatia and Romania and this summer we'll also be doing field work in the Slovak Republic. And my co-author Meg, it, Meg Rinkers has done some work in Estonia. And so I'm hoping that I can use some of this information for both. And to my understanding, there's very little that's been published on women in the executive that accounts for some of the regional differences most of the, the work is on Western Europe, for example. So I've said probably a lot, maybe too much, but I hope that we can now um, open it up for more of a discussion. I wanna thank everyone for your time and for hanging on um, as we've, we've had this great discussion. And thank you so much for your comments and your interest and, um, I think, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, um, and I'm happy to try to address concerns or just open up a discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.